for our text tonight. Praise God. There we go. You there, shout amen. amen. Praise God. Got a few people there. Almost a majority. I think we can begin. We're going to be starting in verse 7 of First Chronicles chapter 17. Now therefore, thus shalt thou say unto David my servant, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat and from following sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you walked, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, made you a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Also I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and shall dwell in their place, and shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more as at the beginning. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, moreover I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will be build thee a house. And it shall come to pass that when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, and I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it away from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. So I'm revisiting this topic again tonight. My house is your house. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the authority that is in your word. I thank you for the power that we have in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this church, for this people, Lord. I thank you for a place in liberty where we can speak the word of God, where we can feel the moving of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that in this house, Lord, there would be renewed dedication and desire for the work of the kingdom of God. Let there be a revival of passion for the things of God in this place. Lord, we ask it tonight in the name of of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. You may be, oh, never mind. I, I just. See, investing in the work of this, this is what David was, was talking about when the Lord was speaking to him in this text. He wanted to build a house for the Lord because he had a nice house now. And he said, well, the Lord's still dwelling in a tent. You know, that's not right. Um, and his attitude was correct. You know, the, he was thinking, I, I have this large house and all these things, but the Lord has nothing, and I want to do something for the house of God. And investing in the work of God has always provided for his people. Again, we go, we go back to, to Adam and Eve in the garden. It was, it was his garden, if you will. It was his place is what he had ordained for them, is what he had given them, but he asked them to do some things. He asked them to take care of the garden. He asked them to, to be there with it, to dwell in there, and to prosper what he had done, to take care of what he had done for them. And they, they didn't put it there. They didn't create it. They didn't build it. But he had chosen that to be a place for them to be where he could commune with them, where he could dwell with them. The Bible says he came to them in the cool of the day and talked to them. They were familiar with that. It was a place of communion with God, a place where he could speak to them, a place where he could show them his love, a place where they could be open and transparent with the Lord, a place of peace. And it was just one thing that they had to be concerned about as not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, people always ask that about, well, why, why would he put a rule there? Why would he, if he knew they are going to break it, why would he put a rule there? Why would he make it? <laughs> he knows that they're going to fail. He knows, why not just give them no rules? Why not just make it so that they can just do whatever they want and then, then there's no rules to break? 
Why does there have to be a law? Why does kind of sounds like the attitude of, of the world today, doesn't it? Why does there have to be a law? Because if you just make it legal, then it'll be fine. If you just do this, then, then there's no law to break. Why, why even make a law? Just let everybody do what they want to do. But because of the establishment of a law, though it may have been simple, it was a way that they could love him. All right, there's nothing that we can do for God. There's, like, there's nothing that we can do to help him out, all right? There's, he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, all powerful. He's got, he knows everything. So there's nothing that we can do to add to his power. There's nothing that we can do to, to lend him a hand or to give him a loan or to do anything to help him. But what we can do for him, the only thing that we can do for him, the only thing that we're capable of doing is obeying his command. So the only way we can show him love, the only way that we could do something for him is by obeying his voice, which is why he gave them a command, because he wanted a relationship with us. And I want to establish that from the outset tonight, that all he has ever wanted, people, people look at God as this, you know, big, powerful, booming voice, but this just authoritative you know, if you do anything wrong, he's going to crush you. And he's just waiting for you to make a mistake and waiting for you to mess up. But really, it's the love of God that defines him. We talked about this just the other week about in John 1, it's uh, 1 John, talking about the love of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. It, it's all this about the love of God. That's what defines him. That's what's defining characteristic of God is his love. So he's always desired this relationship. He's always desired to be loved back by the creation that he so loved and so put himself into. Do you understand that tonight? The love of God is what made these things. It was by the love of God that you were put in this place. It's by the love of God that you're in a place here tonight where you can hear the word of God. It's by the mercies of God, the, the Bible says, that we're not consumed. His, his mercies are fresh and new every morning. He, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve the love that he gives us, but it's his love for us that defines everything about life. That's why people search for the meaning of life and they can't find it because it's the love of God. And when you're looking at every place except for the answer, you're never going to find the answer. But I digress. They were given a law and a commandment, and when they maintained the garden, it maintained their life. It maintained their blessing. It maintained the garden. It maintained everything that was given to them. It was the moment at which they decided not to engage in what God had asked them to do, that they had, they were taken away from the garden. They were forbidden from going back to that place. And it was Noah that even in the midst of everything else that he had to do, and again, there's a lot of modern conveniences, they didn't have it back then, so doing a side project at the end of a workday probably wasn't the easiest thing to do, but yet he built the ark. In spite of everything else, in spite of maybe how he felt, in spite of maybe what he had gone through that day, let me just make it real to you. In spite of having to deal with all the ridiculous, arrogant, and rude people in the world and coming home and wanting to just relax, it was time to start working on the ark again. And he said, I'm going to make an investment. This is hard. This is hard work. And he didn't have any modern tools. I mean, he could probably could have used a power saw or something, but he didn't have it. But he worked hard for all those years so that the work of God could be done. And God took care of him. God took care of his home and took care of his family. It's important to note Noah found grace in the eyes of God. It doesn't say anything about his wife or his children. It says Noah found grace in the eyes of God. But because he worked for the kingdom of God, because he worked for what God's plan was, because he worked on the blueprints that God had given him, God provided for him and for his family. It was Abraham that God called him out of everything that was familiar to him, called him out of everything that was comfortable, everything that he felt that, <laughs> that he, he was, everything was going well. And he, I, well, I don't know if I want to leave this, but he stepped out of everything, stepped away from everybody, stepped forward out on his own, not knowing what was to come because of the faith that he had in God and because he wanted to serve the Lord. And he was blessed 
blessed to the point it says that the his nephew Lot comes with him, blessed to the point where they, they couldn't even dwell together, the Bible says, because of all, all of what they had, all of their possessions that they had, the Lord blessed him. You know, I think about that. He starts out on his own, and then it gets to the point where they can't even live together because of all of this stuff that they have. Think about it. And sometimes it does. It feels like we're starting from scratch, starting with nothing whenever we're serving the Lord. Everything that's familiar to us is gone. Everything that's familiar to us we have to lay down for seeking after the Lord. And everything feels new. And everything feels like we're, we, don't have, we don't have a foundation. We don't have anything there. But the Lord begins to provide for us. The Lord begins to take care of us. And let me tell you, the more that we walk and that we seek after the things of God, the more He will provide the more he will supply your need the more he will take care of you same thing with Moses seeking after the things of God brought him to a place of miraculously leading the God's people out of Egypt across the Red Sea being a leader And the Lord leads him to build this tabernacle, this house where the Lord would dwell, this house where the Spirit of God would be that leads us to this point where he is literally building a house that the Lord ordained. And the people were just so overcome with wanting to be able to contribute to that that they they brought things and brought things and brought things till there was too much gold and too much precious metals and jewels that they said, stop, we got enough. We got enough. I, I think about that too sometimes. About if you if your family had contributed some of the gold to the Ark of the Covenant, knowing that every time the high priest went in there and would feel the presence, see the Shekinah glory of God, sprinkle the blood on that mercy seat, that that gold is something that your family contributed. That gold was something you know that you contributed to the work. And, and what, what a blessing too, right? What a blessing to be able to know I contributed to what God is doing. I contributed to what God is doing in this last day of revival. I thank God for what he's doing. I thank God for the revivals that are breaking out. I, I, I won't go too much into detail, but I got excited. I was listening to um, uh, somebody had shared a video of our uh, uh, one of our evangelists, Brother Taylor Fish, went down to this, this Asbury campus and was there preaching. He felt he had a word from God, and he went down and preached Basically, God gave him the door of, of opportunity to preach to these people, and, and he preached to them from Acts 19, talking about, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And he said, I think that day there was probably, he estimates about 50 people that prayed through to the Holy Ghost, that were speaking in other tongues as God gave the utterance as it was in the, day, in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. He, he, they had that experience. He was baptizing people in Jesus' name. He said there was a young man that came to him that he prayed for that received the Holy Ghost, and that that man went uh, went back to where he was staying that night and didn't even sleep that night, but just went over and over of the video that he recorded of Brother Fish preaching and just took notes from that and didn't even sleep that night and came back and was preaching the same message to the people that were there and began praying people through to the Holy Ghost. This is what it's all about. And when you invest, I'm sure it wasn't easy to take a trip out and go down there and to preach and to pray people through the Holy Ghost, as he said, for about three and a half hours after he was done. Just taking the time to do that. But when we invest in the kingdom of God, we start to see the results. And those people went back there. We're connecting them with pastors, with men of God that believe this truth. We're connecting them all around the, the United States, wherever they've come from. Because And there, there's an investment that has been made there. And to know I put an effort into that. I, I had a hand in that. I, it's, it's such a blessing whenever you do something and make a sacrifice for the kingdom of God. And to know... I had a hand in that. God bless Brother Fish for doing that. I tell you what, that's incredible testimony. But this house of God was supposed to be, it, and again, everything, God keeps going back and telling Moses, do everything according to the pattern that I gave you in the mountain. This pattern of everything that was set up in the house of God, and we won't go into the whole uh, aspects of the tabernacle and everything, but, but they were all supposed to be facing that central place where the tabernacle was. 
all of their tents, the doors of their tents were supposed to be facing this central area where the presence of God dwelled, where the Holy Ghost came down and dwelled above that mercy seat. When they got out in the morning, if they needed to, I, you know, I had thought about this, that, you know, in the middle of the night, that pillar of fire would be there. And what an encouragement to know that in the pitch black of the night, to know that they could walk outside their door and see he's still there. The fire is still there. The power of God is still there. And there's something encouraging when you face your life toward the presence of God. When you, when you posture yourself toward the presence of God and toward the moving of the Holy Ghost, that whenever you wake up in the middle of the night restless and don't know what the next day is going to hold, you know that the presence of God is still there. You can feel the fire. He's as close, the song says, as the mention of his name. When you you just speak the name of Jesus when your life is directed to the kingdom of God when your life is directed and postured toward the things of God you can feel the peace that comes with the fire of God being in your life they weren't supposed to look around and try to pr protect themselves from the enemies but they were supposed to look to the things of God because you will move closer to things that you're putting your, your life toward, that you're focusing on in your life. And we can see that from the illustration of Lot as well. He pitches his tent towards Sodom, and that's where he ends up. And God knows that. God knows that about human nature. He said, I want you to pitch your tents toward that, toward the presence of God. I want that to be what you see when you walk out the door in the morning. I want that to be... <laughs> I want that to be the first thing on your mind when you get out of bed is the things of God. I want the first thing to fill your mind, to fill your vision when you get out of bed in the morning to be the things of God. And so it should be as the church of the living God that whenever we get up in the morning, the first thing on our mind should be what is the Lord having in store for me today? What's the Lord going to do today? Where's the Holy Ghost going to lead me and direct my life today? But it was also a place of sacrifice as well. And I'll get to that in a minute. But, but they, looking toward that wasn't necessarily the most beautiful thing. Getting close to the things of God wasn't necessarily the most beautiful thing to the eye. But there was sin that was being taken care of there. There was sin that was being pushed ahead. Every drop of blood that was shed was pushing that sin ahead, not remitting it as, again, the pattern would show the true Lamb of God when he finally came to take away the sin of the world. And it wasn't a beautiful sight, but sin is being taken away and purifying is happening where the blood is being shed. So David has this desire, this dream, to build a house for, the, for God, the, to build a house for the presence of the Lord. And God's response to him is, well, you're not going to build it. But, but guess what, David? Your son will build my house, and I will establish his house. Because of your desire to build my house, I will establish your kingdom and your, your son's kingdom. I will establish your throne forevermore, and I will take care of you, and you'll be part of my kingdom and you'll be a part of my throne forevermore because of your desire to invest in the kingdom of God. So in faith with that, David, I, be, I believe, just was so excited about that. I can see him just scratching out the plans of what it was going to be like, what the temple was going to look like, knowing that he's never going to see it, but knowing that, and I thank God for the people that have laid foundations in these last days of revival, people that have laid the foundations and laid aside without value previous credentials that they had and previous uh, degrees and things that they had under their name because they were ready for truth and to receive what the Lord wanted to do. And they didn't have any credibility they didn't have anybody that looked to them as being a great evangelist at the time. People looked down on them. People rebuked them for the things that, of the truth that they were preaching. But they stood up for the kingdom of God. And because of that, I, something, something was put into the heart of Solomon 
that even when it became his turn to build this temple, he takes the dimensions of the tabernacle and he, twice the area of that he puts into this temple. Three times the height he puts into this temple and he takes that altar, that place of sacrifice. Again, some, something, something happened in Solomon's heart to show him the importance of sacrifice because that altar he made four times bigger than the one that was there before in that tabernacle. He saw there's something about sacrifice. There's something about sacrifice. And after he does all this, in 1 Kings it says, It came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire which he pleased to do that the Lord appeared unto Solomon the second time as he appeared unto him at Gibeon and the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. And if you will walk before me, as David your father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, then, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to sit upon the throne of Israel. The house of God is where the name is. The house of God is where the name is. And the house of God, you see, when our focus is his focus, Jesus said about, it tells a parable of a man, he says, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, this man will be like a man who built his house upon a rock. You see, we can, I, I always picture this too, this, this parable about this man, the, there, he has a house on the rock, the other man has the house in the sand. I, I picture it as, there's absolutely no difference when you look at those houses. They're the same above ground. It's the same house. But somebody, when nobody else is watching, there's a man who's under the surface where nobody sees is doing the work of God. Hearing these sayings and doing them. You know, and it's one thing to, to be in this place and to worship while we're here. But what you do when you leave this building what you do when you walk out of this door is your foundation. We need to be here. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a minute. The Bible says about forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. Whenever we have an opportunity, we need to be here. We need to be together. But what you do when you walk out that door is what your foundation is. Because, it, and it's very clear the people that have no foundation, when something happens in their life, they walk out that door and that's it. And I, I want to just encourage somebody tonight because what you might be feeling good now, but we need to be ready for the storms because they're coming. They're, they're, they are here and they're coming in a stronger way than we've ever seen them before. The Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the, in the coming of the Lord when he comes back again. So since he's not here yet, that means that it's not that bad yet. Which means it's going to get worse. And we, we need to make sure that we're doing the work of God. We need to make sure, because he said, when you're doing my work, that's like the man that built his house upon the rock. When you're seeking after the kingdom of God, when you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says all these things will be added unto you. The foundation is there. The, you're on the rock. You cannot be moved. You cannot be shaken. The, the Bible says when the storms came, see, they listen, they were standing, they were both standing strong whenever the weather was great. They were both standing strong when everything was going fine. Even whenever there was just a little bit of a, you know, a drizzle or something, everything's still going fine. They're both still standing. 
But the people that were not doing the work of God, where nobody else could see, the people that weren't seeking after the will of God when they were all alone by themselves, those are the people that when the storms hit, they're done. And that, this isn't in my notes tonight, so just take, I just I feel this in the Holy Ghost. We need to make sure that our foundation is strong. We need to make sure that when nobody else is around, we're doing the work of God. We're seeking after the things of God. We're on our knees in prayer. We're taking time when nobody knows we're fasting and tears are running down our face as we're praying for revival, as we're praying for our church, as we're praying for our families, as we're praying for the lost that have walked away, as we're praying for the Lord to heal and to strengthen. And see, the house of God, I'm so thankful for this house. Because, again, when you make his house your house, you are that house that is on a rock. And you've heard probably the saying that says home is where the heart is. And where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. When your heart is for the things of God, that's where your your house is. That's where your home is. And his house is a place where leaders can be found. Exodus records this in chapter 33. It says, it came to pass when Moses went out under the tabernacle, all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses. Just kind of sitting back watching what's happening until he was going into the tabernacle, and it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Everybody's back at their tents just kind of watching what's going on. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend, and he turned again, into the camp, and Moses left after the Lord spoke to him. He walked away, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. This man who was (laughs) chosen, listen, this man who was chosen to lead the people of Israel, the children of Israel after Moses was gone, the man that was chosen to lead them across into Canaan, the man that was chosen to take them across the Jordan River, that was the man that whenever the presence of God moved, whenever they were in the house of God and the Lord began to speak and the, and, and the Lord began to move and, and to, to work, he stayed there even when everybody else was gone. He said, I still want to be here where the presence of the Lord is. I still want to be where the Holy Ghost is moving. Even if everybody, I, I, I pray we, we can get back. Can I say it? I pray we get back to the place where, where people used to just stay at the altar for hours after the service is over. We, I used to see that more even when I was younger. And I know years before that, I mean, that's that that's, was so commonplace. And, and we don't see that anymore. And I, I just, they, there, there, was a, there was a passion that was there. There was a desire there. And there's been so many things that have distracted us. So many things that have gotten in the way. And it just, I, I feel this tonight in the Holy Ghost. Can I just tell you what's on my heart? We, 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 we. We've, we've become so consumed with everything in this world. We've become so consumed with with social media and other things that just distract us and take us away from what's important. We get so caught up in our routines and what we think is going to work, what we think is the best route to go. We get so caught up in our time frames and our sleep schedules and the things that we want to do, the things that we want to take care of, the things that are so important to us that there's so few people that want to just stay in the presence of God. There's so few people in this day and age that just want to pray and just seek the face of God. If we want leaders in this last day, if we want people that are going to stand up against the enemy, if we want people that are going to lead, we need people that 
are willing to pray and to lay down what's important to them, to lay down the routine and the everyday, to lay down and just focus and say, I want the presence of God in my life. Jesus, Jesus, help us, Lord. His house is a holy place. He commanded Israel, he said, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The mitre that went across the high priest's head, in the front of his head, it just said holiness to the Lord, engraved in that gold plate on his forehead. The first thing on his mind was supposed to be holiness. Separation from the things of this world. Separation unto the Lord. Jacob has an encounter with the Lord where he has this dream and these angels are ascending and descending. He, he wakes up and says, surely the Lord was in this place. I knew it not. And he calls the name of the place Bethel, which means the house of God. Place where the Lord spoke to him. And as he came back after those 14 years of service to his uncle Laban, he, he, uh, he comes back. He's, he's going back to confront his brother and the Lord says to him in Genesis 35, Arise and go up to Bethel. It's been a while, Jacob. It's been a while. I think you may have forgotten what it's like to be in my presence, to be in my house. He says, Dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto you when you fled from Esau, your brother. Do you remember? Do you remember, Jacob? When you were afraid, when you fled for your life and you didn't think everything was going to work out, do you remember when I spoke to you? When I gave you a promise? When I gave you a dream, Jacob? When I told you that I was going to take care of you? Do you remember that, Jacob? He says, Jacob and his, said unto his household, that's the first thing that Jacob does here. He says, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. Change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel. The house of God is a holy place. If we're going to be doing the things of God, there are some things that we're going to have to put away. There's going to be some things that have maybe stood between us and the will of God in our lives that we're going to have to put away. There's going to be some things that we're going to have to change. Some routines that we're going to have to Alter just a little bit. He says, put all these things away. Change your garments. Be clean. Oh, Jesus. He said, let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar unto God. I, I want to sacrifice. I want to make an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was in the way which I went and they gave unto Jacob the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed. And, and, and listen to this too. Is that the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them that they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Can I, can I tell you something? You, you don't understand you don't even realize the magnitude of what happens when you began to separate yourself and live a life of holiness unto God. There's some things that might be attacking you, some things that might be burdening you, some things that might be invading your mind and causing you to fear and causing you to not know what's going to happen the next day. But when you make up your mind, I'm going to lay some things down and I'm going to go to the house of God and I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to build an altar and I'm going to give this to the Lord. I'm going to lay down the things that are comfortable. I'm going to lay down the things that are familiar. And I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. The terror and the dread of you will be upon every spirit that is out in this world. When we began to sacrifice for the things of God, something begins to shake in the atmosphere. They journeyed, the terror of God was upon the cities round about them. They didn't pursue them. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. And he and the people that were with him, he built an altar. He called the place El Bethel, the God of the house of God. You see, something changed. 
It wasn't just the house of God anymore, but he knew the God that was there. And there, there's something different from just having an experience with God and knowing the God that gave you the experience. There's one thing to come to the house of God and to be blessed and to let the Holy Ghost fall on you, to have an experience where your sins are washed away. But there's another thing whenever you begin to know the God of the house of God. The house of God is a place of sacrifice. You can go through the book of Leviticus and be rest assured that there are plenty of types of sacrifice that they were required to make as the children of Israel. So many different particular ways that they could sacrifice and reasons to sacrifice, times to sacrifice, things to sacrifice. It was a place where blood flowed freely, where things were killed day in and day out, where things were laid down. And I tell you what, I'm so thankful that we have a place. There's an altar. It doesn't necessarily look like the altar that they might have had in the Old Testament, but this is where some things die. This is where some some blood of some dead things begins to flow. This is where burdens are laid down. This is where addictions are laid down. This is where people are freed from the things of this world. It's upon the altar that's in the house of God. We need the house of God. I said it before, I'll say it again, that the house of God, that you, you might be able to feel the presence of God anywhere you go, but this is the only place that's dedicated to the presence of God. And as a side note, this is just my personal conviction, but this is, This is why I feel it's important to read from the Bible when you read the Bible. I know we have apps and everything for that, but this is the only thing that is just dedicated to the Word of God. It doesn't have a battery that goes out. It doesn't have a light that messes you up from getting sleep. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. There's an importance to the Word of God as well. Can I just say that? I I, I think I might have shared this the last time, but I'd heard... um, a testimony from a missionary that he was in the underground church in China, and I thank I thank God that that's there, and uh, I thank God they don't give us any details, so we have plausible deniability. <laughs> uh, I but anyway, he he said a brother there got bat, was baptized in Jesus' name in his bathtub in his home, and he said this man it, the the word of God was so precious to him that he wouldn't even pick it up until he first washed his hands. He just felt that it was precious. Amen. Just throw that out there. But next, the house of God is about serving one another. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says it this way. It says, let us consider one another. And observe, watch, be, be watchful of each other. See what's going on. He said, to provoke unto love and to good works. How can we do that? How can we see what's going on? How can we be observant of each other? How can we feel in the spirit what's going on? He says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Again, and I'm not trying to harp on church attendance or anything, but the the bottom line is, exactly, you ought to. And it's not about what you're going to get out of it. And this is the thing, I think sometimes we miss the big picture. There might be a reason somebody needs to see you praying at the altar to help them come up to the altar and pray. And if you decided not to come to church that day, you've just robbed them of that. So, well, they should pray anyway, but maybe God was using you. Do you think about that? Maybe God wants to use you to be a leader. Maybe God wants to use you to be somebody of consistency that somebody else can look to and say, I want to be like that. And it helps them from falling back into the things of this world. It's about serving one another. That's why it's saying don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but observe one another, consider each other, to provoke to love and to good works. This is why we do it. His house is a house of prayer. I mentioned this earlier, Jesus 
references this from Isaiah 56 about my house shall become a, shall be a house of prayer to all generations. And you know, I was I was feeling this too. Just again, I'm just being just being open with everybody tonight. And I begin to think about this. Why is it? And again, just just hear me. Just hear my heart. Why is it that the house of prayer? the thing that we seem to do the least is pray. We're here for an hour, hour and a half. We say, let's pray about something. It takes about 30 seconds, and then we move on to the next thing. Or we say, let, you know, we have an altar call, and it lasts, you know, five, ten minutes sometimes, and, and that's it. But it's the house of prayer. And again, I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. I'm just, I'm just feeling that in the spirit again. It's, I... And it's not unprecedented. Again, we have these people that have not even experienced the power, the full power of the Holy Ghost at these college campuses. This is what Brother Fish was saying on his video. He's, they were there for multiple days just repenting is all they were doing because of desires there. And if, if we could, do, and we, we've, we've received the Holy Ghost, we've received the power of God, how much more, how much more precious should it be to us in the house of prayer? I mentioned this in my title. I'm making his house our house, and you know we kind of kind of want to feel be people that we're close to. We wanted to feel that way, like hey, my house is your house, you know. And there, there's there's a level that I, I think is great whenever you can get to a place where somebody can come into your house and they they know they know where the glasses are. They can go out and get themselves some water, and they don't even have to ask you because they're just so comfortable in your house. And, and I, I love when you can get that close to people and have friendships like that. But that's, that's the way we should feel in the presence of God. That's the way we should feel with the working of God. And it, it goes both ways. We need to have a place where he's able to feel comfortable to walk into our house and say, oh, I don't know if I'd really do that with, with that. I, you might want to get rid of that. I, I don't even think that that looks right there. And, well, it's my house. It's, well. But he's he's your guest. It's it's his house too. You know, and if he he be, he gets rid of something or says I don't like this or maybe you should get rid of this, it sh we should feel comfortable with that. If we want his house to be our house, and we also need to realize that we can be comfortable in his house as well. There's so many things that we miss. The the prodigal son. First off, I do want to say this too. The prodigal son. He didn't get into the riotous living and then leave the father's house. He left the father's house first, and that's when he got into riotous living. I know that might have been on his mind, but he didn't do it while he was in the house. And when people start stepping away from the house of God, when people start stepping away from the things of God, when people start stepping away from the work of God, when people stop praying, when people stop witnessing to people, when people stop sharing the gospel, when people start stop thinking about what the Lord wants, that's when they slip into those things. And the older brother, on the other hand, we give him a lot of grief, but he realized that the, house, the father's house was all about serving and was all about sacrifice. And he says that to him. I, I've, I've, just, I've been working. I've been serving in your house all these years. And I haven't broken your commandments. He realized it was about keeping the commandments of the father and doing his work. On the other hand, the older brother says, you know, you, you never gave me anything to make merry with my friends. And he's, he wouldn't even go into the house at that point, because he perceived, I get this, he perceived it as a lack of benefit to him, so he wouldn't go back into the house and got angry when somebody else was getting the attention. And he, I, I want to hear this, I, I felt this on my heart too, that it, he didn't even get it, that that brother was dead, as the, as the father says, and now is alive. He didn't get why they were celebrating. Had he been happy about his brother being back and excited about him coming back, there's so much judgment out in the world that we need to be sure that we don't slip into a judgmental attitude. 
and that we don't start thinking about just ourselves. He's saying, well, I didn't get to have a party. Yeah, but you weren't out there with your life being squandered, with years being wasted, and regrets that you'll have the rest of your life either. My God, think about what, what you've been able to have in the house of God. Think about the benefits that are in the house of God. Think about all the blessings that are here. And he said, son, everything that I have is yours. What do you mean I didn't throw you a party? He, he was dead and he's alive. And you've had a, why he was wasting his life away, starving, squandering everything away. You had all the blessings of the house of God. And there's two types of selfish. One says, give me everything now so I can do what I want. And then there's the one that says, well, it's not benefiting me, so it's not worth being there. And, and I just kind of hit me with these two brothers. That's kind of what was going on. He missed, the older brother missed that his house was the father's house. And whatever was happening there was his And we need to be able to understand that we can take advantage of what what God has given us. The Bible says if we have hope in this life only, we're of all men most miserable. Because if we have the Spirit of God in our lives, if we have the Holy Ghost work and we have the truth and the Word of God, and then that's where we stop. And we don't exercise the blessings that God has given us. If we don't work in the supernatural realm, if we don't believe in in faith, lay hands on the sick that they might recover, that we might walk out and preach the gospel. Believe that people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost when we pray for them. Believe and have faith that God is going to work. Seek after the things of God and See what he might do. Then we're of all men most miserable as this older brother was because he didn't realize any of that. He just was working for nothing. But when we, and this is, again, uh, revisiting just these couple points here before, before I close up. I won't be much longer. But when we seek the kingdom of God first, it adds to our house. One area of this is our finances. Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because up there, it's going to last forever. There's going to be no moth and rust corrupting those things. Thieves can't break through and steal that. Whatever, you're, whatever satisfies you here in this world will be gone. Whatever makes you happy here in this world will be gone. And just think about it. It's, you know, we get, if we're lucky, the Bible says 70 years. And, you know, after 200 billion years worth of eternity, it's going to seem pretty small. It's not really worth anything here. Nothing in this life is worth it. We're spiritual beings. God created us in his image We have an eternity. Do you understand that? He created all these other things to have a beginning and an end. He created us with a beginning and no end. (laughs) We have so much to look forward to. And there's a man, Jesus said about who built all these barns and had this incredible harvest. And he said, I'm going to tear down all my old barns and build bigger barns and say, "Take, take your ease, self, have a good time, enjoy what you've done. And he says, thou fool, <laughs> this, this day your, your soul is required of you. And he said, these people are not rich toward God. He wasn't rich toward God, toward the things of God. You see, it didn't matter how much he had to store up. He could have had stuff stored up for years. And sometimes we think, oh, man, if God would just bless me with a million dollars, everything would be great. It's like, yeah, then you die the next day. What, what good is it? Or maybe you don't even get the check and you're gone. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, take no thought for tomorrow. No man can add a cubit to his stature. You can't just, and we, I tell you what, we, I'll put myself in this bucket too. You know, we're so guilty of worrying about things. And it doesn't do anything. We could we could spend the whole night and lose sleep about what's going to happen tomorrow. And you know what? That's not going to change tomorrow. We could get all stressed out about it, eat a whole bottle of Tums, 
And it's not going to change tomorrow. But we have a hope in Jesus. He said, consider the lilies of the field. They, they don't do anything to provide for themselves. But Solomon in all his glory that everybody from around the world came to see his wealth. They're not arrayed like he was. He takes care of us. He knows what we have need of before we even ask, the Bible says. And I encourage you. I encourage you to just ask and it shall be given unto you, the Bible says. Just because he knows it doesn't mean you just skip asking. This is where the relationship comes in with God. See, the kingdom of heaven is counterintuitive. That's why the Bible says we have to walk by faith and not by sight. Brother Frankfurt talked about stewardship. Malachi, you know, we brought this up about, he says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse he said that there might be meat in my house. It's my house. And see if I won't pour out a blessing that you can't contain it. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> see if the Lord won't bless you when you give unto him. I've seen it over and over and over again in, in my own life. Whenever, Honestly, honestly. You just purpose in your heart with sincerity, I'm going to give to the Lord and watch him do something before you even get a chance to give it. I've done this where I didn't even have something yet and I, I purposed in my heart to give and God just recently and God, God blessed me with double that amount. I haven't even had a chance to give it yet. That's just what happens in the kingdom of God. It doesn't make sense. But it's the kingdom of God. With our family, Jesus, they come up to him and said, your mother and your brethren are, are out there. They want to talk to you. And he goes, who's my mother and my brethren? It's the people that do my word, that see, that do the word of God, that seek after that, to do it and to listen to it. Those are the mother and the brethren that I have. The Lord gives us so much. The Lord gives us so much. Whenever we see that our family is the people of God, he gives us so much that we might not have the best families in this life, in this world, but we have the people of God where it goes so much deeper than just this flesh and blood. And he says, to, there's those that he, he was saying the last day that, you know, you, you were, I was sick and you visited me. I was in need. You, you know, you came to me. And, Lord, when did we do that for you? He said, well, if you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, the people that are doing my work, if you've done it unto them, you've done it unto me. When we start seeking out everybody else's good and everybody else's wealth, the Bible says, he begins to bless us. And we need to stay consistent, too, even for our family's sake in this life. I believe that there's, you know, the Bible talks about that. He mentions about even a husband and wife, by a wife's conversation, by her, um, the way she acts, the, the pure way that she acts, she can win her husband to the Lord. And I believe that this works in every situation, in every friendship. <laughs> Praise God, Brother Keith knows what it's all about. Amen. But in every relationship, every relationship this works when we're consistent. The prodigal son's father, he didn't leave the house. They always knew, the prodigal son always knew where to find him. They always knew that he was going to be there. He always knew where his father was going to be. So whenever he decided to come back, he knew his father would be there waiting for him. Finally, I'll, I'll have you all stand. I'll be finishing up with this here. But whenever we seek after the kingdom of God, not only with our family, with our finances, but also with our future, the Lord provides for us for our future as well. When we look after his house, he provides for us. He said, sow and you'll reap in due season. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. What he's saying is if you, if you do things for my kingdom, if you start investing in my kingdom, I'm going to begin to bless your future. You See what I mean? It's counterintuitive. You plant a seed over here and something starts growing over here. It doesn't make any sense. You do something for the kingdom of God, you plant one seed here, and all of a sudden there's a whole orchard over here in your life. Because that's what happens when we invest in the kingdom of God. Because of the work Solomon did on God's house, people came from all over to see 
what God was doing and to see the presence of God. See, that's where the presence of God dwelt was that temple. And it became a witness for those around the, the then known world, the power of Almighty God. It became a place God promised if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. If they look toward this place where my name is, I will hear them. And I, I think of think of a man named Daniel. He's away captive in a foreign land. And he, he remembers, he opens his window toward Jerusalem where the name of God is, where that temple is. And he prays three times a day. And I can almost picture Daniel. Lord, you said that if we, if we face toward Jerusalem, if we face toward where your name is and where your presence is, where your house is, if we focus on you, Lord, if we, if we gear ourselves toward you and put our focus on you, you said you would bring us back, and he did. Jesus, I thank you. The temple became the place of the early church. It says... They were breaking bread from house to house, but they were every day they were in the temple. Every day they were, they might have been different houses here and there, but they were every day they were in the temple for the house, for the, for the hour of prayer. That's where the lame man at the gate, beautiful, was given something more than the silver and gold that he wanted. was because there was a place where the presence of God was and people that were invested in it. Uh, Jesus talks about these men that had, Talents one 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 two and one five. The man with five and or the two and the five, they double what they have. They invest in the kingdom of God. The other man says, I don't care about it. I'm not going to invest in the kingdom of God. And he has nothing. But the those that invested in the kingdom of God kept everything that they made, kept everything that they had, because when they invested in the work of God, you understand that? They were given something from the Lord and they invested it in the kingdom of God, and then their eternity they they had twice the amount that they started with all to themselves because that's what happens when we invest in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you might be also. Our final destination, our retirement plan. Everything that we do in this life is for eternity. Everything that we do in this life, we got a mansion waiting for us on the other side. We have an eternity where we don't have to worry about any tears or any sorrow or any hurt or any pain anymore. Because when we invest in the kingdom of God, when his house is our house, we have so much to look forward to. The Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, peculiar people, holy nation. That you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. That we, we have a work in his house to do. Try the Lord. And if you make his house your house, see what the Lord will do. Could we just take a moment to just kind of renew some commitments here tonight to the things of God as, as we sing here. We'll take a few moments to be able to just pray and some, dedicate some things to the Lord tonight.